Welcome back to Black Bear Forge. What do you say we get back to work on our axe project? It needs to be ground and cleaned up a little bit. Then we can harden it, temper it, put an edge on it, put a handle on it, and it should be ready to put to work. So far, the only grinder we've looked at using in this project is the angle grinder. And, to and I'm going to go ahead and continue with that. I think an angle grinder is something you're more likely to have in your shop than a big belt grinder. Belt grinder is way faster. I think the abrasives for a belt grinder are a little bit cheaper in the long run. But an angle grinder will do the job. And since it's a tool most people have in their shop, that's what we're going to use. If you don't even have an angle grinder, you can do all of this with a file. Just do a much cleaner job of forging so you don't have to do so much filing. Now I have in this box some abrasives for the angle grinder. I don't usually keep finer stuff for the angle grinder around, but I went ahead and ordered some stuff from McMaster Car. Ordered it yesterday afternoon. It was here this morning. And I have now an assortment of flap discs in 36 grit up to 400 grit. And I think 400 grit is more than a fine enough finish for this. So let's start this just by looking at the profile. If you make a lot of these, it's worth making a pattern piece to trace on here. I know I want to take that little bit down. This side looks pretty good. I actually like this corner better, but because this one is back a little bit, we're going to have to, to deal with that. And we can do some final grinding after it's hardened and tempered, but it's easier to grind and your abrasives last longer if you do it after normalizing or annealing. So that's pretty much the shape that I want to go for. Really very little has to be taken off of this. Unfortunately, since it's tapered, it's hard to hold in a vise and I don't have a pivoting vise jaw. Maybe we'll make one of those one of these days. I'm just going to start with a hard disc initially because it lasts much longer and then I'll go to the flap discs for the cleanup. I've gone ahead and taken all the areas that needed grinding down to a 220 finish. I do that for two reasons. One, a lot of this I don't want to have to grind again after it's hardened and tempered. I want to let some scale build up during the hardening process and blacken this so it has an even finish even in the areas I ground versus the areas that are left as forged. But also because if you leave a coarser scratch mark across the cutting edge, it can create a stress rise or a place where a crack might form. So taking that down to a 220 finish near the cutting edge is a good idea. And I don't take that all the way down. Still at least a sixteenth of an inch thick. That gives it good support during the hardening and tempering. Also reduces the risk of cracks or warpage. So this is now ready to harden and temper. But before we do that, let's take a little bit of a closer look at it and see just what it looks like at this stage. Oh, and it does get hot grinding, so probably not a good idea to grab it with your bare hands after you're done grinding it. So here is the axe, ground and ready for hardening and tempering. We've created a much more pleasing profile, kind of cleaned up the points that form the ears here. Try to make a match from left to right and top to bottom, both. And again, I did not 
take the edge down to a sharp edge. We'll save that for afterwards. Remember, he who would a good edge win must forge thick and grind thin. But I, I do like to clean all this up and make that nice and smooth just because I think it makes a better profile of the ax. But when we harden and temper, that'll get black and it'll blend in with this much better. Now the main thing I want to look at is the eye. One of the reasons that a wrapped eye ax is so nice to make is because it's a good way to get your eye nice and symmetrical. This one's tipped over just a little bit here and I might clean that up with a die grinder. But generally, you get a much more reliable eye this way. You don't have to punch it. You don't have to have a power hammer or you have to be able to cut a straight slot through the ax body. You just make the eye, wrap it around, and it can be a much more reliable way to make an ax. Now one common problem with an ax like this is that you end up with a split right here. When you drift it, this shoulder doesn't weld up quite perfectly and you end up with just a little split. It's really not a big deal unless it wants to run all the way, which means your weld's not good, but a little bit of a crack right there from the weld not sealing isn't much of a big deal. I really don't have one here. I'm real happy with the way this welded up. But if you've got something like that, I wouldn't worry about it too much. And that's one reason we leave this thick. We started off with two half inch pieces here, which is an inch of material right at the eye. And here when we're done, we've reduced that down to about five eighths of an inch. So we forged almost half of that material down as we refine this weld. If you start with too thin of an area, you can't do that and you don't get that nice weld that way. You also can't see any of this weld. It's often common to see just little bits of where the tool steel edge is, especially back in here. But that upsetting and working the blade this direction as we forge weld it and then coming back and forge welding the flat pushes material into there and forge welds it in and that helps prevent that seam from showing. So all in all this one came out exactly the way I want it to come out. The only thing is there might be a little cleanup inside the eye and you can do that with a die grinder or a file or you can just make the handle fit it the way it is. Now we've done the rest of this in the coal forge and while I would typically harden and temper in the electronic heat treat oven, let's stay with the theme of keeping this simple and using fairly basic tools to do all this. So we're going to so we're going to use the coal forge for heart heating this. It's 1075 steel, 1075 steel hardens in oil. Now unfortunately, this is not one that shows up in the Heat Treaters Guide companion app that I have on my phone. It's a great app for hardening and tempering and looking up specific hardening temperatures. But since we're not going to be able to set a specific temperature anyways, and it's a simple carbon steel, we'll use the, it's a little higher than non-magnetic theory that works pretty well for carbon steels. I don't like that method for steels with other alloys because those other alloys change the critical temperature, but non-magnetic still occurs at about the same range. Somewhere around the 1400 to 1500 degrees is where it becomes non-magnetic. And that's pretty good hardening temperature for most of the simple carbon steels. And then we will quench this in the same commercial heat treating oil that I always use. It's just a product I bought from a local oil supplier. I said I need five gallons of heat treating oil they ordered it for me. I don't remember what the brand is, but there is stuff out there. Parks 50 is a good brand. McMaster Car sells a couple of, couple of different grades. And somebody gave me a link a while back to Black Bear heat treating oil. And when I replace this, that's probably what I'll buy just because it's got a cool name. As part of the hardening, I'm going to get the entire ax body up to heat and then just quench the cutting edge portion. And for tempering, I will then quickly grind using the angle grinder and a flap disc a shiny edge on this so I can watch the colors run. As this changes color, that gives you an idea of what the temperature is. And for an ax, I want to take this into the bronze or peacock range, as they call it. Not quite to blue, that's a little bit too soft, but straw is a little bit too brittle for an ax edge that's going to be swung and used pretty hard. So for a chopping edge, I like to go into that bronze or peacock range. Anyways, let's go light the coal fire, let's get it hot, let's harden it and temper it, and hopefully we'll still get a handle on it today. Well, I've built a ridiculously large coal fire only because the bottom rusted out of my coal bucket, and I had to dump the coal somewhere, so I've just put it up here. 
Don't worry, we don't burn it all up if we don't need it. We just pull it to the side when we're done and we use it for the next fire. There shouldn't be any surprises in this process at all. We've looked at hardening and tempering quite often on this channel. So we'll just go through it again for review. If you're interested in more detailed information on hardening and tempering, I'll link to a playlist up here that has several videos that deal with it in more detail. I've actually put the pole into the ax in first to heat it up so there's some residual heat in there and that'll help with the tempering process. It also helps bring everything up slowly, which is much better than bringing it up fast. Gets a good even heat for good hardness throughout the cutting edge. But real slow, you don't need a big hot fire. This has a lot of fuel around it, but that doesn't mean the fire's excessively hot. Make sure you take some time to preheat your oil. It is way more efficient to quench in warm oil than it is in cold oil. Being hot, the oil thins out a little bit and that improves the quench properties of the oil. It's actually a little bit faster quench in warm oil than it is in cold oil. So that's what I'm looking for on the end there, on the pole end. Now I want to heat this very slowly, so I'm just going to let it soak with the blower off for a few minutes. Now I haven't turned the blower on at all, and that's really getting to where I want it. Magnet doesn't stick anywhere on there, so I just want to even that heat out a little bit. And we'll go into the oil. Work it up and down on the oil, but don't quench the whole axe head. You're only quenching the cutting edge, but you don't want a sharp line of demarcation between hot and cold because that can cause a crack. You just want to get the cutting edge cooled off, and then we're going to polish it up real quick. using the angle grinder with that same 220 disc we were using. And just polish back far enough that I can see the colors running. Now since this was the first side I finished polishing, it's going to show the color change faster. And I hope you can see that on camera. Right up in here, we're already turning a blue color, so there's heat coming from here that's still pretty hot, even though it's not glowing anymore. And you, down in here, we're starting to see the straw color. Next, we'll be looking for a bronze. And I would ideally like to get this edge to a bronze. And if there's enough heat, it doesn't hurt to do this twice. Really wouldn't hurt to do it three times. It usually is not perfectly even and it happens fairly quickly compared to hardening and tempering in an oven. So that's a darker straw. That's getting pretty close to what I call bronze. A little bit of peacock. They're starting to turn purple right there, so I'm going to go ahead and quench this. Just the, just the edge, because I'm going to go ahead and try to draw colors a second time. Some of this that you're seeing here that's still in that peacock to blue range is left over from the last time. That's just color change. That doesn't mean this part is actually at that temperature right now. But as it, the rest of it changes, we'll be able to watch it change. These colors are not a result of hardness. They are a result of temperature. You're merely judging temperature doing it this way and you are judging hardness based on temperature. 
So it pays to know your steels and look it up and do some practice pieces. And then you can kind of figure out what's what. But doing the double temper does help to make sure it's all nicely stress relieved and you don't have any hardened cold spots and, or hardened soft spots. But that's turning straw again. It moves much slower the second time. I rarely get a third time. It usually doesn't have enough heat left to do it the third time. Putting it in the kitchen oven is perfectly fine. About 450 is usually good enough, maybe 500. Depends on if it's going to be a woodworking tool or a camp tool. This is a camp axe. It's going to probably get some hard use and abuse. So it's better if it isn't quite as hard. I'm just going to quench this corner that's already starting to come up purple. And let the colors continue to run some through here if they will. Yeah, it's a darker straw. I don't think we're going to make it into the bronze range this time. Now you can see on the back where I didn't polish it this time that it's a much darker bronze. So that's what we have from the last go around. And quenching it in the oil does affect this a little bit. It does change the way the colors behave. Not enough for my purposes, but it is a theoretical factor. That's just because the oil keeps it from oxidizing the same. These are oxidation colors. So I'm going to go ahead and quench the whole thing now and just cool it all off so we can clean it up and then handle it. So the first thing I want to know is, did this get hard? Now it's been tempered, so it shouldn't be glass hard. So if it files with difficulty, but not too much difficulty, it's probably just right. And that is exactly what we have. If you needed to sharpen this with a file, you could, but it's going to be a little bit of work. So it's a fairly hard ax. A little softer might be okay, but it doesn't really need to be. So I'm going to go back to the angle grinder. And with the 220 flap disc that we used over at the anvil, I'm just going to clean up the areas that show the oxide colors and get the axe blade looking the way I want it to. I don't want to grind too far back. I'm not trying to polish the whole thing. I just want it to be aesthetically pleasing. After that, I'll probably go back to the 60 grit disc. We'll put the bevel on here and get it close to sharp. Then we'll probably come back to the 220 grit, clean up the bevel, then go to 400 grit and clean it all up. And that should bring it down to just nearly as sharp as we're going to want it. If in use somebody wants it sharper, they can polish it with a strop or use a very fine stone on it. But for most camp axes, people don't really keep them that sharp anyways. Now remember that the angle grinder can get this hot enough to bring back some of those tempering colors. You don't want to bring it up into the blue range. That's going to temper it further than you really want it tempered. Make the blade a little bit softer. Not going to be the end of the world, but try to avoid that. So if it gets hot, if it's too hot to put your hand on, go quench it. At this point, it's okay to quench it in water because it's not that hot. But now that we're done with the 220 on the main part of the axe, let's go to the 60 grit belt and actually put a bevel on it excuse me, 60 grit disc. You can tell I usually use a belt grinder. Remember, you're going for a symmetrical bevel on this, so make sure you turn it back and forth and keep checking it and you want to stop just before you get a little burr going on the edge. Now back to the 220 grit wheel just to clean up the bevel. And at this point, I do want to raise a little micro fine burr right on the edge. That means I'm right down to a good cutting edge. 
Once you get that far and it's polished, there's no reason to go further. So for the final grinding or sharpening step, I'm gonna to go to a 400 grit disc and just take the scratches off of this. I've already got a burr, so I don't need to remove any material. I just wanna clean it up. And that's really all there is to it. This is plenty sharp enough to use at this point. Like I say, if you want to take it to some finer diamond stones or oil stones, water stones, whatever you've got, or if you want to go to a buffing wheel, leather strop, that's entirely up to how far you want to take it. But in the interest of trying to keep this simple and obtainable, I'm not going to go too far with it. Most axes you find people using aren't this sharp anyways. So this will make an excellent camp axe, and if you take care of it, it can stay this sharp. Now the next thing I want to do with this before I put the handle on is I have a hot melt coating. It's an Evans strip coat product and I don't have the exact model number. You can look around for hot melt coatings. They're made for dipping tool edges in to protect both the tool edge from being damaged or rusting and from the person working with the tool, like the guy putting the handle on, from getting cut with it. So I'm going to do that, and that protects it from here on out. I leave that on when I ship. It's real easy to just grab it and peel it off. Sometimes you can even put it back on one or two times if you need to protect the edge. But that way it's protected while I work on it. I'm protected, and it's protected in shipping and less likely to try and cut its way out of the box. This hot melt coating goes in this industrial crock pot looking thing made just for the purpose. And it melts. You dip the edge in and let the excess run back into it. This isn't something I would invest in if you're just making a few axes for yourself. But since I ship these and work with quite a few axes and adzes over the course of a year, it's worth it for me to have this stuff. Make sure you turn it back off again because the stuff will scorch and it could, be, could burn if you leave it on all night. Our axe head is complete. It has been hardened, it has been tempered, it has been ground, it has been sharpened, and the edge has been protected. It just needs a handle, so it's a little bit easier to swing, unless you want to swing it this way. The drift that I used is sized for commercially made axe handles. This way I can buy handles at the hardware store. Generally I buy them in bulk from House Handle Company in Missouri, and I'll try to put a link down in the description to, to House Handle. I've mentioned them before. And that way I know these are going to fit. Now this one I think is a little bit short for this axe, although it's not bad. But I think based on the discussion I had with the customer, this is probably a little bit better handle. And this is a 14 inch, I think they call it a scout axe handle or a boy's axe handle, something like that. Generally I just buy an assortment of handles and then I just see what works for the project I'm on. And it goes into the eye of the axe. Unfortunately, the handle is a little bit too small, so I'm going to need to remove some material through here until this handle seats all the way into the axe head and makes a good fit. If that doesn't work, I might have to make a handle custom because I don't have another option for this except for this really big heavy thing and I just don't think that's the right handle. By the way, this axe right now weighs one pound, six ounces, so just under a pound and a half. So I'm going to take a look at this and see how close the handle fits on the back side here, see where I need to remove some material, maybe make a pencil mark in here where I know the ear is going to go and make sure I get enough there. The ears, or I believe they're called lingettes, can be a real problem. It's much easier to see the handle that is straight across the bottom, but these really look good. They do add a little bit more surface area for the handle to fit better. So I think they're worth doing, if nothing else, because I really like the looks. But it does make fitting the handle a little bit tougher. And for this, I'm just going to go back to the angle grinder here. And I'm going to put a 60 grit disc on there. And that should be plenty coarse enough to remove the little bit of material. In fact, it's coarse enough, you've got to be careful not to remove too much. Okay, you can see that's scorching a little bit. I need to get a fresher abrasive here. This is one that's been used on steel. This is still 60 grit, but it's brand new, so it's good sharp abrasives. Okay. 
You don't go too far too fast. You can really take off too much material doing it that way. But this side is starting to fit much better. Take off just a little bit more here. Now I frequently do all this with a draw knife and we've looked at that in previous videos. I'm just trying to show something a little bit different and a little bit more blacksmith shop using grinders instead of woodworking tools. I believe Brent Bailey does all of his hammer handles with an angle grinder and assorted abrasives. Well, it's just almost perfect. I'm going to tap it in a little bit further here. Now at this point you might want to go to a draw knife or spoke shave or just a good sharp belt knife. We've got this knife one of you sent me for opening packages. It's nice and sharp even on this hard hickory. And I can just take off that little bit that needs to be taken off there. You kind of look for the black marks or the snags where the handle hung up and started to raise a chip or a burr. And those are the places it's touching. It fits very nicely now around this part of the axe and the wedge will spread the top part and make it fit nicely. So I think we're getting really close. As you can see here, I've got a, a little ridge where it's actually shouldering up here and I don't want it to shoulder. I want it to wedge on there, not bump into something. So I'm going to go to a 220 grit abrasive disc here and just clean this up. And you can see this finer disc, because it's such a fine abrasive at that speed, is scorching the wood a little bit. So I'm not going to do any more with that. Just something to pay attention to. On the belt grinder, I can turn to use my lower speed belt grinder and I don't have that problem. But here again, a sharp knife. This knife isn't really the perfect knife for this, but it's the one I happen to have in the shop. I'd have to go down to the basement wood shop to get a different one. And anything that shows after the handle is done, I usually go over with a card scraper or with sandpaper there again if you don't, don't have a cabinet maker's card scraper. We've looked at that in previous videos on handling. So before I put this back in the axe, I want to make sure I've got a wedge that's going to fit, and that one's going to fit just fine. I also want to make sure my saw kerf is deep enough that it's going to do me some good. That's only going about halfway into the axe because so much sticks out the top, so I'm going to deepen that. I've got a scrap piece of leather I can wrap the handle in so the vise doesn't gouge it. And because a hacksaw is what I happen to have right here at the bench, I'm just going to use a hacksaw. It works just fine. Okay. So that should go on there just the way we want it to. We've got a wedge that's going to work just fine. I need to clean it up just a little bit. And typically, I glue my wedges in. So I think I'm going to go get some wood glue from the wood shop before I finish seating everything here. Don't go away. Okay, I'm back. Got some wood glue. So let's go ahead and put this axe handle in here. And if you aren't familiar with handling tools, it's generally best to drive the handle into the unsupported head and the inertia from the head is what pulls it up tight onto the handle. 
This then is your last chance to take a close look at the fit and make sure everything is hung the way you want it to. This procedure is where the term can't get the hang of it comes from. If your axe is on there crooked or tip forward or tip back, just tap the wedge in a little bit, put some glue on the wedge. Because this is tight, the glue helps kind of lubricate it going in and then once it dries, of course, it's glue, it holds it. I generally set this on an anvil to drive it, but since you can see the vise, we'll do it here. That wedge goes in all the way. It's one of the things I double checked on the size of the wedge. And I like that. Now once this is dried, the glue is dry, I will then trim this. So we'll be right back, we'll trim this up and make it look pretty. And then in the last 30 seconds of the video, you get to see the finished axe. I've let the glue sit for a couple hours so I don't have to worry about dislodging the wedge when I cut the top of the axe handle off. Frequently I'll just let it sit overnight, but I'd like to go ahead and get this video done. In the meantime, I've been doing some other stuff in the shop, been running the gas forge making hold fast, so if I'm all hot and sweaty now, that's the reason. I got it up to 90 degrees in here. It definitely feels more like summer all of a sudden. But the next thing I want to do is I want to cut this extra handle off. Some people do leave the handle long. They like that. I like to cut it so it's about a quarter of an inch taller than the axe body is. Just an aesthetic preference, whatever it is you want to do with your axe. And to do that, I'm going to protect it with that piece of scrap leather I was using earlier. In use, this axe is going to get all scratched up, but that's for its new owner to do, not me. And again, because it's available, I'm going to start this with a hacksaw. Of course, that isn't the prettiest end on there in the world, so we're going to try to fix that. You can certainly do this with the angle grinder, just be careful not to hit the axe body. You can also do some of it with a coarse file. This is one advantage to leaving it taller than the axe is. You don't have to worry about scratching up the axe while you work on this. Then I will frequently take a knife and just kind of bevel this edge a little bit, but I think I'll wait and do that when I get inside and I have a knife that I'm a little bit more comfortable with for that kind of work. The only other issue is do you want to put a metal wedge in? Not everybody likes a metal wedge. Some do, some don't. And that's just up to you if you want to put one in. I don't think I'm going to in this one. Another thing to think about when deciding whether to use a steel wedge, and for that matter, it's something you need to consider when you're wedging it in the first place with a wood wedge, is this stresses the weld joint. If your weld is not perfect, you can theoretically blow an axe apart by over wedging it, by driving that wedge too tight. And it's more likely to happen with a steel wedge than it is with a wooden wedge. Now in the 20, 30 years I've been making axes, I've had that happen I think two times, and both times it's because the steel wedge actually came into contact with the axe, so it was steel pushing against steel, pushing it apart. It was not the wood that was pushing it apart. And that also means that the weld was not perfect. If your weld is a good forge weld, it's as solid as the original material and the odds of you blowing it apart are extremely slim. On the other hand, you do see some old axes with that little tiny crack right there where that weld seam is a little open because it wasn't refined well enough initially or because the wedge opened it a little bit, but because the blade receives so much more work and so much more refinement at welding heat, it's good and solid and it's never going any further and it's not a big issue, but it is a cosmetic flaw and some potential buyers might really be offended by that, so it's something you need to think about when you're making the axe and when you're putting the handle on. That almost completes the making of our traditionally styled wrapped eye axe with a forge welded in steel bit. 
I'm still going to do a little cleanup on the handle. I'm going to use a card scraper to clean off all the grubby blacksmith fingerprints. My wife often refers to me as the grubby blacksmith, by the way. Then I'll put some oil on it, and I'll take some nice close-ups of it that you can see at the very end of this video if you stick around for the last 30 seconds. Did I say that already? Anyway, I hope you have time in your day to get out to your shop, but stay safe. Wear your safety glasses. We'll see you for the next one. Heck, I still have to go back and shoot the first part of the first video that you guys watched three weeks ago, and I haven't even done it yet. <laughs>